Hallelujah. You know, I, uh, I just uh, have felt uh, in the weeks leading up to today, I've felt uh, this real, uh, uh, I guess, uh, just uh, a, a, a feeling in my spirit about um, uh, the fact that we uh, have different people in our congregation who are going through uh, challenges and going through trials. And um, I uh, was around this uh, passage of scripture, you know, Paul uh, speaking about things like uh, rejoicing in the Lord and uh, saying uh, that he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. And um, so just my sense about uh, the fact that people people are going through, and I know some of them, I don't know every one of them, but you know the uh, the word today is, is an I believe an empowering word for uh, for us uh, that is going to impact uh, dispositions. You know, I believe even things like where we tend to be anxious, we tend to worry, we tend to get mad, we tend to get whatever we get. I, it's like the power uh, of God to touch us, and I'm just naive enough to believe that uh, that when we come into the presence of God, when we're looking for God to do something in us, he has uh, this incredible power that even sitting where you're sitting right now this morning, that there's this power and authority of the Spirit to touch us. And so I want to say today that uh, I believe God's given me an, a word that's going to really empower you for where you are, for the for the things that you're facing, and who knows, that may even very well change just the way that um, that you see life, and it, it's it comes right out of this passage of scripture today. So I want to talk today about the sufficiency of Christ, and let's just read those few verses from verse four, chapter four in Philippians, and he says, "Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Uh, the Lord is near." Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord uh, that at, uh, at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you've had no opportunity to show it. And he's writing here a personal letter to the Philippian church. You uh, give Paul a gift, and uh, you get in this letter, of, uh, and he's instructing, and he's talking to them about these concepts. He has this personal word he's just giving to them, and he's saying, you've, been, you've reached out, and you've helped me. And he says... Uh, uh, I am not uh, saying this because I'm in need, for I've learnt to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learnt the secret of being. Con I've learnt the secret of being content, in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I wonder how you'd go saying, uh, in a, you know, if someone said to you, I have learned exactly what Paul is saying here. Saying, I have learned to be in every situation to be content. If someone said that to you today, uh, uh, what would you think? 
uh, w would you be a little skeptical? Would you, uh, would you, you know, if it wasn't the Apostle Paul, and you know that it's in the Bible, so you know I can take that from Paul. But what if it was someone else? What if it was, what if it was me that said that to you? <laughs> I've learned how to be content in every situation. Or would you, would you think, whilst I was saying that to you, would you think, well, you don't know what I go through. You don't know my situation and my needs. You don't know my health condition. You don't know what I need financially. You don't know the uncertainties that I face uh, and the circumstances I'm in, the things that are happening in my home. You're not married to my husband. And you certainly don't have my children. And yet, it's like Paul is just making this statement right across all of those things that we might say and might throw up. And, 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 and makes this claim, rejoice. Have a joyful disposition. Rejoice in the Lord. And again, he says, in case you didn't get it the first time, I am saying it because I mean it. Rejoice. Be a person full of joy and contentment. And you get this uh, message that what Paul is actually saying is proposing a way to live an ideology. A kind of person to be. Be a person who rejoices in God. Be a person who knows how to be content in every situation. <laughs> it's something, and uh, you know if you uh, and you and if you you can't miss it. You can't miss it in this letter because he's talking about rejoicing and about joy. Uh, something like approaching twenty times in this letter. Then he uses words like being glad another three times. You you, you can't you can't miss it. Paul is, it's like he is really saying, I want you to get the message, be joyful, have joy, have a joyous disposition, know what it's like to live a, with a contentment and a calm and, and those sorts of concepts and things that you feel, that you understand being joyful. Have that characterize your life. And so you could be inclined to think that, you know what, if Paul is writing about this, uh, he's, in a, he's in a place where it's a great time for him to talk about that. He's in a space where life has given him some respite, where he's got a, you know, where he's got maybe a lucky break, where in the pressures and, and in the uh, and in the strains of ministry, Paul has got some time <coughs> to say to Epaphroditus who was with him and was writing some of these letters, perhaps saying to him, Epaphroditus, I want you to get this message uh, to the church in, in, in Philippi. I want you to write to them, rejoice. And uh, you got that? Have you got that? Have, can you spell it? Have you got your... And, and, and write it again. Write down the rejoice again. It's like everything has just, uh, for some time, come to a good place. And if you were to think that, that he's writing about joy, that he's writing about rejoicing, that it's a good time for him to be talking about it, you'd be dead wrong. <laughs> because Paul is writing this out of a prison. And he's writing it in, the, in a backdrop of, of unbelievable struggle and unbelievable suffering. You know, where uh, this time now represents around about five years of being in jail. Imagine that. You know, it's fine when it's someone else locked up. What if it was you? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That is uh, two years in uh, uh, in Jerusalem, it's uh, another year or so traveling, and he's probably in a Roman jail here another two years. And if you look at the amount of stuff that he's achieving in his life and doing, to be locked up for five years and do nothing, 
heard something. He's been stoned and left for dead. <laughs> He's been shipwrecked. If you uh, had a shipping, if you owned a fleet of ships, you wouldn't want Paul on them. He's, everything, every time he got on them, it seemed like, they, like he was getting shipwrecked. Uh, he was, uh, you know, he was, he was so uh, uh, not the flavor of the month in Jerusalem that there were people uh, that said, you know what, we're not going to eat until we kill Paul. How do you like that? It's kind of like, you know, uh, he was beaten with rods. He was, uh, he was, he was whipped 195 times, five times. 39, he was whipped and, uh, by prison officials. And, uh, you know, and these, and these prison whips were, were kind of torturous. They had things put in them so they'd rip your flesh. I, um, I think about Singapore and, uh, you know, Singapore have got the lash. And we had a policeman who was in our church one time and he was, and he'd talk about how they would, how people would get this lash. And um, it was horrible. He said, like, you know, people would call for their mother. I mean, it was, this was not someone just, you know, my mother used to hit us with a wet face cloth. That was nothing. You know, this, Paul is, Paul is, Paul is uh, lost everything. And uh, he's writing, rejoice, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. But, but isn't, it, isn't it something? Isn't it, isn't it so, uh, you know, kind of jarring to your mind that, that you can get in the middle of a letter like this, you can get suffering. You can get them, and, uh, and he's telling us, and the theme verse of Philippians is rejoice. Uh, and, and right in the middle of all this joy, and saying be joyful, there's suffering. There's this parallel theme. And you don't have to look far. If you looked in Philippians and just read through it, you'll see it. I'm in chains. I've lost everything. You know what? I could even die. Uh, uh, that, uh, that seems to be running there along with its message of saying rejoice and be joyful. It makes me want to ask two questions. It makes me want to ask why is that the case? Why are these opposites uh, here? Why is it that life has to be like that? Why is it that our life, instead of just having some kind of middle road and not having, uh, not having these extremes, not having uh, uh, struggles like that, why is it that in the middle of my joy, I'm, suf I'm there suffering? And the second thing it makes me want to ask is what does Paul know that I need to know? What does he know about how to do life after such a record of struggle. What is it that he knows that I need to know? And uh, I want to share three things with you, and I'm sure you could find more, but just through this passage as we've read it this morning. And uh, I, I want to give you three that I find here that Paul talks about um, what we... Uh, what marks us, what, and he's and is firing them out in rapid fire through this passage here. Yeah. And I want to talk about them for just a few moments. He, he says, uh, live without anxiousness. He says, uh, don't be anxious about anything. You know, worry is a... Uh, I don't know who worries easily. I don't know who's the warrior in a, in a family. Sometimes you get one that's more, more panics about anything. Sometimes maybe neither panic. But, um, you know, it's such an easy thing to, to worry, to think about many things. Think about 
how life's going to work out. Think about a problem that you've got. Think about, um, uh, you know, are you going to have enough money? Think about something in your family. I don't mean to trivialize that. Uh, uh, we live with uh, so easily in a frame where we can, where we can begin to worry, where we can be anxious. And, um, you know, the, the extremes, the extreme is devastating. That when uh, worry becomes so uh, overpowering and overwhelming and, and makes it so that you don't feel like there's a way out, we have a big problem in our society with this. And we have a big problem with where it ends up. It's not funny. Uh, that uh, uh, that we can worry, that people do worry. And it seems like uh, the kind of season, the time that we're in, that it's unprecedented. That people uh, are, are under tension and stressful. I describe it, uh, if you don't believe that, just get in your car and drive 80 kilometers in the 100 lane on the freeway. You'll find out. There's a lot of me behind you. Anyway, um, do you know what I'm saying? That I say that people are wound up and they're drum tight. And you, and you dare not blow your horn at somebody because you never know what it, what it sets off. But we are living at a time when people are so full of tension. Our society, people, our neighbors are full of tension. But Paul says, I'll tell you how you actually avoid this. I'll tell you how you can get past worrying. I'll tell you how you can get past anxiety. He says, pray. <laughs> well, there's something new. He said, uh, pray. But you know what? He, he, he says the way to do this, to pray, is to be very specific. With God. Tell God everything in detail. You ever get around my mum? That's one of the bits of advice she'll give you. And she's not here, so I can talk about her this morning. Um, get it in detail. And, and, and with a, an attitude, Paul says that God can do it, and thankfulness, he said, let that characterize how you pray. And he says, he says, something will happen out of that. You will find that a peace that passes all understanding, a peace that you couldn't get if you could solve the problem, uh, a, a peace that uh, is unusual for the situation, he said, you'll find a peace like that in the midst of your trouble. I've seen people like that. I've seen people who, when... And I've seen them here. Uh, that when a situation is tough and difficult uh, and you don't know how they can actually get through, there's a certain calmness about them right in the thick of their trouble. A peace that passes understanding. They can keep going. They can keep strong. And, and, and he says, and he says, what that will do? He says it will it will guard your mind. It'll guard your mind. You know what? You can you can stay sane. You can not have your emotions playing havoc with you. And you keep your. You can think rationally. And if you think that's nothing. <laughs> Let me tell you, it ruins everything when you're not rational, when you're not thinking straight. It ruins everything. And will guard your heart. And he's, so, you know what he's saying? He's saying out of a prayer life, out of a prayer to God that's detailed, telling God this detail, these are the things that will happen. You'll have a you'll have a you'll have an unusual peace. You'll have a God, a mind that's guarded and a heart that's guarded. 
you know, that uh, your values, the things that you hold to, the things that might tempt you to uh, abandon your post, you'll be able to stand. You'll be able to, in the fiercest heat of the storm, you'll still be able to stand. Wow. The second point in verse 5 is a gentle spirit. A gentle spirit. You know, he says, have a gentle spirit that uh, the qualities of which are a, uh, are a reasonable person, a person who's fair, a person who's charitable, someone who doesn't major on the minors, someone who doesn't react or seek revenge. You know, I talked to a prison guard at, at Acacia Prison, and he says it is surprising the number of people in there that are just like you and me, except they had a moment where they lost control and did something illegal, something terrible. And, 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 and in writing that verse, it's almost like Paul does a segue He's talking about gentleness for one moment, and then he says the end is near. The Lord is, the Lord is near. It, it, it's almost odd that he should go from talking about have a gentle spirit and the Lord is near. That close. And you know, I think for me, what this means, it means that we should not be so obsessed with things uh, because, because they matter and they're small things, like, the, like sweating the small stuff. And I was in a room where someone was dying, my, uh, my sister-in-law. And uh, I, uh, you know, let me just tell you, well, stuff you know and stuff that happens. That, you know, sometimes not all the things that we do in families are smooth. You know, it's like there are moments when things are tense and things are not great. And you do things. And you know, as she was there in the last, my gosh, the last hour of her life. I, re I felt this in my spirit. Lay down your weapons. Lay down your weapons. Don't live life with a weapon in your hand, you know? Um, because there is something more beyond this life. There's something beyond this. There's something that we work on that we have a greater picture beyond this life. Some wives would like a gentle husband to come home. <laughs> they would. Some, some children would like a gentle father. They'd like someone who is not mad and angry and wound up. They'd like a person like that to come home. It's worth, it's worth thinking about. It's worth, uh, it's worth opening your spirit to that and be a person who's gentle. It doesn't mean you have to be a weak person, you know that. It's not, but a person who's gentle, a person who's sensitive, thinking about others. It's what he says in, this, in these letters to the Philippians. And the third point is this, um, I'm enabled by Christ for everything. Have a gentle spirit, don't be full of anxiety, and remember that Christ enables you for everything. Enables you for everything. I uh, I wonder uh, how Paul endures the trouble that he endures and doesn't complain to God because I think I would be complaining long ago. You know what, God? I serve you. How come this happens to me? How come uh, how come I have to go through this when someone who doesn't serve you at all 
their life just seems to go on without any issue. Um, but there's something about the fact that uh, that life, uh, and sometimes you know that kind of idea that because we serve God, because we're a Christian and following Him, uh, there, there's sometimes the sense. That, hey, listen, you know what? I'm doing this. God ought to do a good job looking after me. He ought to do better for me than someone who's not serving him. I have that idea. That sometimes uh, even a mindset that says, you know what? Because I become a Christian, I'm not going to have any more trouble. It just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. And, and we don't want to hear that. We don't, we, maybe we don't, I, I'm sure we preach it. But uh, you would know that if you were a politician and they took you to the very first class that you were going to uh, learn about being a politician, the first thing they're going to tell you is don't tell people anything bad. And you think about some of our prime ministers, I know this gets beyond the younger people here, but there were some of them that their whole leadership term was uh, the, most, the most endearing or, or prominent thing or memorable thing about their term was we remembered that they told us something we didn't want to hear. Remember Malcolm Fraser? Life wasn't meant to be easy. Remember Paul Keating, that it was a recession that we had to have. They marked those 10 years. I see in Manjimup now they have a cake shop uh, a bakery called Let Them Eat Cake. Well, they were the last famous words of some, someone who had something to do with, this, with the French Revolution. So, you know, it's, um, you don't tell people bad news. But Paul's resolved this. He's resolved this. He said, I am poured out like a drink offering. And he's come to a place He's come to a place where he's not looking for God to take away his problems. He wants Christ to be there. He wants Christ to be in the midst of it. He said, I want to know him. I want to know Christ. You know, in our struggles, in our lives, this assurance that Christ is with us, in our problems. I found a verse uh, reading uh, through Philippians that was quite amazing. It was quite amazing. And listen to it. In chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Because of my chains, most of my brothers are preaching the word. Do you know what that means? That means that out of our struggle, people's lives are impacted and touched. Amazing. When we think that we don't qualify, when we think we, do, we cannot tell people rejoice, they actually, we can. I want to finish with this. Uh, um, I was listening to, you, you, I was listening to a preacher on this uh, passage of scripture and he was talking about uh, someone who he really respected, who was an older person, and he said, this person had a saying. You know, you know people get sayings and they, they, they can make this, they make an expression. I'll tell you what my mom's one is if you don't know it. It's thank you, Jesus, for everything. You get around my mom long enough, whether you drive bad in your car, something happens. Thank you, Jesus, for everything. That's just what she says by reflex. And... Um, uh, um, this preacher uh, was saying that this person who he knew would say, for this, I have Jesus. And uh, his thing was, everything that he, he would regularly say, so it became almost like a trademark statement, for this, I have Jesus. And um, uh, he uh, uh, said that even in, this, in the time of this man's ill health when he had strokes, uh, two strokes, and you could barely speak. He said, I could still hear him on the phone when I rang him, even though I could barely understand him, saying, for this, I have Jesus. And you know, as we close today, and uh, we get Crystal to come here, uh, as we close today, I want to 
say to you that I know, I know that we, uh, life's not smooth. Uh, we, we know the suffering that Paul talks about. We know that. We know the struggles that don't seem to make sense. We ask the questions, where is God in this, if he's God? We ask those things. But I want to say to us today that um, we ought to have confidence, this confidence of Paul, that we rejoice, that we are able to be content because we have Christ with us, enabling us and helping us. Amen. Let's pray. You know, I uh, believe today as we, uh, as we go through this, I believe today that for some of us, the Lord is just saying to some of us that you don't need to worry anymore. You can stop worrying. Uh, I, I believe for some of us, God is saying uh, that uh, if you're, if you're uh, disconnected, uh, if you, if you, uh, you know, if you're angry, that you can you can change that. You 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 can change how you do life, because because you have a Christ who is enabling you in every situation and every circumstance. That you can you can find a peace about your future, about the things that, that are wrong. You can have a peace because, uh, because Christ is there and his promise is to be there. And his promise is that he will give you strength for what you need. And that you can change your disposition. And you can give out joy. Uh, that can be what comes from you in your workplace, in your home. People around you here at church, you can give that out. That can, that can, that can just come from you because you, you resolve that you're going to be that kind of person. You make the decision that I'm going to be a person who rejoices, who chooses joy, chooses to be joyful. And Christ who enables you will strengthen you to do that. He'll help you do it. Speaking to somebody today who... Uh, you know who this is the, this is the most furthest thing from the way you live and how you describe your life and how you'd characterize it it's not joyful and i feel like god is saying to you today you know you can make a choice in a moment and let it begin let it begin now And I want to urge you, if you feel like the Lord is speaking that to you, that you do it. Because what I feel like the Lord is saying is that this is attached to a lot of things. It's attached to your children. Uh, it may be attached to your grandchildren. The way that you respond, the way that you uh, continue and conduct yourself around people. And then I feel like God is saying to somebody here today, you've got to worry less. You've got to, you've got to trust me. You've got to not look at, uh, at things and the fact that you would be better if you had more things. I feel like God is saying to you today, 
I want you to stop worrying. I want you to stop worrying, but I, and I want you to adopt a contented, a, a contentment. I want you to decide that you're going to be a person who's going to be contented. It's going to be satisfied with whether you have things or you don't have them. And I'm just going to ask with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if, if any of you feel like that, that that's something that applies to you, I want you to just raise your hand and just hold it up with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. The person was not going to worry anymore. Much. Amen. But stop worrying. Amen. 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 It'll be a person who is, decides that I'm going to live with a joyous disposition. And I feel like what God's promising and saying to you is that you'll see that sovereignly change in your life. You know, you'll, you'll see steps that uh, just are amazing that don't make sense in how quickly that changes and people are going to speak to you and people are going to say to you I don't know what happened in your life but there's something different about you there's something different about you and then the last thing I want to say is this is that for some of us, God's really calling us to a different kind of prayer. It's almost like God is saying to you, I want you to speak to me in detail. I want you to make your request known to me. It's not like God doesn't know them, but it's he's saying, I want you to do this because it's for you. And God's promise to you is out of this passage of scripture that says that if you do that you're going to find things change in your mind and in your emotions and in uh, the atmosphere around you that you're going to be more peaceable you're going to find that you worry less that you're more content that you feel more secure that your emotions are not all over the place you're going to find that happens if you'll do that if you'll do that and just before we close I want to ask you that if there's anyone who's never made a decision for Christ feel like you really want to commit your life back to Jesus you know we talk about these things happening because we are associated with Jesus but maybe for you the first thing is is that you've got to say Jesus I need to just connect with you again I need to get my life back to you maybe being something that you've done in your life but you need to recommit or you've never done it I'm going to ask you in just a moment that if you're wanting to recommit your life to Christ uh, if you uh, want to make a decision to serve Christ I'm going to ask you just now if you want to do that, I want you to raise your hand and hold it up. No one's looking around. You want to make a recommitment of your life to Christ. You want to do it today. Give you a chance to do that. You know, you can't have any of this without Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You can't have any of it without Christ. Anyone else? Anyone else? Father, thank you that uh, as... We see these commitments uh, to you. And we see these responses. I pray, Father, for the, for the work that your Spirit does uh, to make that a changing moment, a changing time, a watershed, a shift right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Crystal, you